Let's take a look at a second problem. This involves a pressure vessel. So you can look at it in a number of ways, an aircraft body, a tanker that contains natural gas, rocket casings, which are spherical in shape. The constraints are if they're mobile, they need to be light, but at the same time, they should be safe. That means they should not fracture or they should not fail by yield. And so the motivation will become for a situation such as this, where you have a pressure difference delta P between inside and outside of a sphere of thickness T and radius R, what materials can be best suited for the construction? In this kind of situation, when you have a pressure difference of delta P for a wall of thickness T and radius R, the tensile stress, the wall, is given by the equation delta P times R divided by 2 times T. So we will use this as a constraint. So the function is as pressure vessel. Constraints are it should not fail by yielding or by fracture. The diameter is specified as R and the pressure difference is specified as delta P. The objective is to minimize the mass and you're free to choose the material as well as the wall thickness. So that T in the design equation is what will be eliminated when we are looking at the objective of minimizing mass. The first constraint of the wall stress indicates that the wall stress should not exceed sigma y, the yield stress. The second constraint on the wall stress is that it should be less than kic over square root of pi times c, where kic is a fracture toughness and c is a, a flaw, a crack that is generated. These are the two constraints that we'll have to work with and for each of those constraints, we will minimize mass by first computing mass m in a similar manner as we did for the earlier problem. Now you have mass as rho times the volume, which is 4 pi r square times t. And then we go through two different constraints. On the top, you have a yield constraint. And so the wall stress delta p divided by 2 times t, the whole thing multiplied by r, should be at best equal to sigma y, the yield stress. And then if you eliminate t, then you will be able to use that in objective function of minimizing mass. Use this over here, and then you will be able to get one equation for mass, which will be dependent upon the density and the yield strength. Here r is the radius, rho is the density, p is t is the thickness, c is the crack length, KIC is a fracture toughness, sigma y is a yield strength. For the second constraint, then we will use the fracture constraint where this term over here, the wall stress, should be at best equal to KIC over pi C for the fracture constraint. Using the first derivation where you combine the yield constraint with the objective of minimizing mass, you get a mass which is a product of the functional index, the geometric index r cubed times 2 pi, and then the material index rho divided by sigma f. In the second situation, we based on the fracture constraint where you solve for t in, by combining the fracture constraint with the objective for minimizing mass, you will have m2, which is again, a product of the functional index, a geometric index that combines now the radius as well as the crack length, and then a material index of rho over kic. Fracture toughness and density are both uh, material properties. kic over rho is a specific fracture toughness. Sigma f over rho is the specific yield strength. To be in order to derive the material indices, we set the two masses obtained by the two constraints equal to each other. So M1 first has a material index of rho over sigma f. So M2 has a material index of rho over kic. The coupling equation is found by equating M1 and M2. And so then you have capital M1 and capital M2 replacing small one and small M2. And if you take logarithms on either side, you can obtain the coupling constant, which is basically in this case, the square root of pi c. If you plot M1 versus M2 in a log-log scale, you can have multiple lines with intercepts of square root of pi times c. 
So based on this, let's then go ahead and create a material based on the two axes using the material indices. So you have row over fracture toughness on the y axis and row over yield strength on the x axis. Look at these func funky units. It's good to pay attention to units so that you're making sure that magnitudes are right. Again, you'll have uh, ceramics dominating this portion, the metals dominating the lower portion over here. So if we use this plot and for different crack lengths, whether it's five millimeters or three orders of magnitude smaller, five microns, what happens in terms of what are the best suited materials? Remember that based on the crack length, the coupling constant has to be computed as square root of pi times c over here. And so pi times c, the square root of that entity, is what we will use as the intercepts in these log log plots that we just looked at of m2 versus m1. So when c is five micrometers, you have c sub c, the coupling constant, computed and given by this particular line. And when the crack length increases to five millimeters, then the coupling constant uh, can be used to generate a coupling line. And in this case, you have the second coupling. In the first case, you have basically some of the ceramics that come in handy. But when you go with large cross sections, you will need to have materials with large, that can tolerate large cracking. And so at that point, you end up going with titaniums, steels, aluminum alloys, and so on. So when crack length can be large, metals dominate. But despite their high density, their toughness and strength work in their favor, and these are the safer materials to use. In aerospace, you'll use titanium alloys. Usually, you'll use stainless steels for trucks. The crack length, when it's tiny, before which failure and fracture occur. Then carbon fiber, reinforced plastics, some of the ceramics work out great. So these don't work out great in general intention. So wall stress for those kinds of situations will be bad because you have flaws that can be no greater than five microns. It turns out that when you're making very tiny structures, such as MEMS, we see the MNTC, Micro Nanotech Center on campus and Shoemaker Research Building. So they create MEM structures out of both silicon nitride and silicon carbide. Do you know what MEM stands for? Microelectromechanical system. For those, you can use some of these ceramic structures. And usually you form that by using ceramic precursors that are deposited as thin film. Now, having looked at the second case where you go through sorting out multiple constraints in a single objective, one thing that is left behind is to be able to generate a penalty function when you have multiple objectives, such as minimizing both mass and cost. And so we make a trade-off plot, and then we plot contours that are based on this slope of minus one by alpha. The job for the next class is to be able to work with problems where we optimize the solution for minimizing z, and that will be the focus for the next class.